So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Alan Balch, the CEO of the Patient Advocate Foundation, as well as the National Patient Advocate Foundation. I know we have people still joining us, but we've got a lot to get through today. So I'm going to go ahead and get us started, although I know uh, people will be rolling on. Um, so th thank you for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate everybody uh, coming and gathering uh, at this meeting, especially uh, given the challenging times that I know everyone is facing. Um, certainly, uh, we didn't anticipate hosting this session uh, through a virtual means. Uh, we've never done this before, but like all of you, we're adjusting uh, to the new uh, virtual opportunities. And we have tried to take the most uh, of this opportunity uh, to leverage uh, different multimedia uh, uh, applications through this three and a half hour event. We know that's a long time for you to stick with us. Uh, we're so happy that you have joined us. Um, and there's one benefit is there's lots more of you than we can normally host in a in a in a venue. Uh, so we welcome the hundreds of you who are joining us today. We've uh, really tried to maximize this opportunity, both in terms of content and in form, to take advantage of the current environment we find ourselves in. Um, so we'll have uh, videos for you. We'll have a docu series. We'll have podcasts. We'll play throughout. We've got panel, the more traditional panel settings, and of course, as always, we have some data presentations um, as well. Uh, the inspiration for this event really comes from the decades of history that um, our organizations have spent uh, not only helping uh, patients with various health inequities and addressing social determinants from across racial and ethnic groups, but also the impact of place uh, and geography in that mix as well. You know, it's, it's very obvious. It's really important to pay attention to the issues related to vulnerable populations as they relate to issues around race and ethnicity, but also place is an important factor in that uh, mix as well when we think about health disparities and health inequities, especially when those two things converge, when you have issues of race and ethnicity that combine with the challenges of geography. Uh, and, and there's a particular challenge, as we all well know, in rural America. So thus the, the title uh, for this particular policy consortium and the emphasis and the content on rural health care challenges and opportunities in addressing health care inequities. Of course, we'll talk about issues of transportation, food insecurity, caregiver burden, um, all the things that we know um, from the 20% of roughly 20% of the patients that we serve who come from rural populations in our case management, um, in our case management program. Um, so that's sort of the, been the inspiration we've, uh, in, over the years, spent a lot of time going out into rural communities, not only serving them through our case management, but programs where we go out into rural communities and, and address the real world problems of patients in those places. So uh, this content and the inspiration from it really stems from, uh, from, from really seeing firsthand what it's like to try to access uh, the world's most expensive and complicated healthcare system from a, a geographically um, uh, challenging uh, environment. So with that, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to our Executive Vice President of Gwen Darian, um, uh, the Executive Vice President of Patient Advocacy and Engagement uh, to run you through the agenda and give you a little bit more of what you're gonna hear today. So take it away, Gwen. Great, um, thank you, Alan. Normally I would be coming up to the podium. Alan and I would give, be giving each other a hug. Then we would be going down to the podium. There would have been a lot of hugging in the room. Um, and so this I think is a very challenging, um, this is a very challenging time for many of us, but I think like the, um, like the title of this, um, of this policy consortium, there are also opportunities. And as Alan mentioned, we've really decided to embrace the digital world in this. And we've decided to look at what we can do to extend what we, were, what we would do in a policy consortium in person and look at different media. So we are actually debuting a docu-series, um, this is the first time we've ever done this, about three, um, three people from three di very different communities in uh, very different rural communities across the um, United States. We started about six months ago. We've actually been working on this project for about six months and, and we have a lot of um, a lot of 
things that we've done in different media. We started a podcast series, Advocates in Action, and you'll be hearing some excerpts from that podcast. Um, and we've thought about how we could actually do a panel in this kind of um, virtual environment. We have two panels and then one data presentation. Um, I think that one of the one of the real uh, Alan was talking about the impetus for this in terms of the inspiration of our patients at, at um, PAF. Um, there's also an inspiration that is our current socio-political um, environment. And I think we would be remiss if we didn't talk about that at all. I mean, we are in a time where there is um, increasing divide among this country, um, but there's also increasing opportunity to talk about some of these issues, at least among um, at least among some communities, about how we reach equity, how we talk about um, the moral determinants of health, the social determinants of health, the political determinants of health, and we will be we will be addressing that as we go through this policy consortium. The other thing that has was is very clear to us, and it also fits in um, very much with the way that we approach everything that we do at PAF and NPAF is that there is no one monolithic rural rural America. There are a diversity of communities who, who face a diversity of challenges. And there are also um, there, there are also common experiences, as Alan mentioned, transportation, caregiver burden, um, the, um, the access to specialist access to hospitals, which you'll hear about in, um, from some of our speakers that are only just exacerbated by being in rural America. And so we wanted to really take a look at, um, look at the patients we serve, which is one of the inspirations for this, but then also some of the people and the change makers with whom we've worked. And our, I wanted to particularly um, thank and um, recognize three people who you will hear from today who were really the inspiration for a lot of what we were, a lot of what we're doing. And um, Tammy Taylor, who's one of our longtime patient, she's actually a nurse practitioner, volunteer advocates, um, who is a nurse practitioner, an advanced practice nurse in the Mississippi Delta. And some of this came out of conversations um, that Tammy and I had in during our um, some of our gatherings of our of our advocates and the particular the particular barriers that she and her patients face in getting equitable affordable quality health care and then my friend and colleague Freddie White Johnson who you will hear from who has um, started a cancer research foundation in the name of the um, of the great civil rights activist Penny Lou Hamer in the Mississippi Delta. And Alma McCormick, who's a member of the Crow Nation, um, and Alma and I met on a community engagement working group together, and Alma is in the Crow Nation in Montana. So a very, very different, a very different viewpoint. I, um, we have, one of the things that is central to everything that we do is the way, is looking at trying to elevate the ways that people can tell their stories and elevate people's elevate people's put voices. So in this um, policy consortium, one of the opportunities that we really have is to is to elevate people's voices for you throughout this. We don't speak for people. We give people an opportunity to speak for themselves. And I'm hoping that what is what you'll hear today, I'm hoping that you'll be inspired by many of the different um, stories that you hear. And not to be, not to, um, not to be, um, there are, will always be challenges, but there always will be inspiration and opportunities. And there always will be ways that we can kind of shine a light on the projects that people are doing, look at the passions that inspire them, and looking at how they find meaning and purpose from the work that they do in their communities. Um, we, I usually start out these policy consortia with some slides, but I decided this time we've got enough. Um, you're already looking at the screen enough. But we talk, when we talk about um, Patient Advocate Foundation and National Patient Advocate Foundation, Patient Advocate Foundation is our direct patient services organization. And we really look at, at um, building change 
one patient at a time and one community at a time. And at National Patient Advocate Foundation, we look at what we, we learn from the patients that we serve and we create um, initiatives that help to alleviate and mitigate the barriers that they are facing in accessing equitable, affordable quality care. I also want to point out that, and something that Alan talked about earlier, is this kind of through line of equity and equitable access. And this is something that is that is propels and inspires all of the work that we do. And you'll see through today where that how that storyline is sort of woven woven through this. Um, I'd like to go through the agenda just quickly and tell you what to expect today. And then we're going to turn to our program. So we're starting today with, with obviously, with, with a welcome and introduction from Alan and me. Then we have our first, um, the debut of our first docu-series, which is called Promises to Keep. Um, it's about Freddie White Johnson, who works in the Mississippi Delta. She is a um, she works in as the director of the Mississippi, Missouri, Mississippi Network for Cancer Control and Prevention at the University of Southern Mississippi. And she's also the founder of the Candy, Fannie Lou Ham, Hamer Cancer Center. And she'll talk to you about some of the um, barriers, barriers that her um, community faces, but also some of the things that she's done to overcome those barriers. And I think the other thing I would say, and I, you know, we... Um, you will probably see this throughout these stories is the other, the other thing that we can't forget to mention is the impact of COVID on rural communities, on communities of color, on communities who have, are less highly resourced. And you'll see in all of these um, and all of these stories and in all of the, um, and all of the panel discussions, what that effect has been. Um, you'll see little you'll see little glimpses of it. For example, pictures of Freddie handing out masks to her community. Then um, we have a, as I mentioned, we're having we have a podcast series. So in between each of our um, events, we're going to have a we're going to have a transition, which is an excerpt from a podcast, and I hope that will um, inspire you to go and listen to the full podcast. Um, as Ellen mentioned, we are always take um, much of our inspiration from the patients that we serve. So we has, have a data sp spotlight by Kate Gallagher, who is our VP of Health Services Research, and she'll tell you some of the highlights of the data that we're finding from our patients who live in, in rural areas. Um, another podcast ex excerpt from one of our advocate volunteers, Jessica Jones. And then a, um, our second docu-series, which is really about food insecurity and food as one of the primary um, social determinants of health and, prim and primary um, issues that we have to solve in order to solve these social determinants of health. And we're coming from the North Country, which is um, rural New Hampshire. Then we have a panel moderated by, um, by our friend and colleague, Ashley Freeman, who's, who's on our patient advocacy and engagement team with Michael Fratkin, Jeanette Johnson, Judith Serber, and Tammy Taylor. And this is about partnerships. The, in this panel, the, um, you'll see healthcare providers who are, um, who are paired with a patient and with a, um, with a caregiver. And it's really about how you create that respect, that trust, and that dignity. And then once we get through that, at, we have another podcast ep excerpt about how two moms became greater together. So some of these stories about it are about individuals, and some of the stories are about how people working together really were able to um, create change. And these are two moms in Alaska, which if um, has they, they are both look at, um, they, which has such significant transportation barriers as well as barriers and access to um, barriers and access to specialists, especially for people with rare um, diseases. Then we finish our do we finish our documentary series with a documentary about Alma McCormick called A Messenger for Health. It's about how Alma built up a um, from the grassroots a um, a program that really 
brings health and health services as well as health education to her community, the Crow Nation in Montana. Um, Chris Wilson, our friend and colleague Chris Wilson will then, who's also on our team, will then um, moderate a panel called Resilience, Hope and Change in Rural Communities. And that will focus, that will have um, the three people who are featured in the documentary, Alma McCormick, Chad Prue, and Freddie White Johnson. I'll do some summary and closing remarks and then, because our role really is to amplify voices, we will finish up the day with, um, we'll finish up the day with an excerpt from one of our, another one of our long-term advocates and activists, Rebecca Barnes. Um, and we, um, and I hope that you will be able to be engaged through the day. We have three. Um, three sections, I almost forgot this, of Q&A. Um, we're gonna have one after Kate Gallagher's presentation on data. We're gonna have the other after the second panel, Partners in Care, and another one after the third panel on um, Hope and Resilience. For each of those, if you would put your questions in the chat box, our colleague Jamie Trotter will moderate, um, will, will moderate this discussion session. session. You are, we have, we have the kind of Zoom meeting where you can turn your camera on should you choose. Um, you're welcome to, it's great to see everybody's faces, but it is an invitation as my daughter would say, not an obligation. So I am, I am, I'm extremely excited for this, um, for this podcast. I am, I am, one of the things that I've done since I've started in advocacy nearly 25 years ago was to look at, look at how we could change the public dialogue about serious illness. And that the way that we changed it has been, has, um, has evolved over the years, but I really think that we have an opportunity to change the public dialogue about equity and reality of living and trying to access equitable, affordable, and quality healthcare in rural America. So thank you so much for joining us. I look forward to your questions. I look forward to a great pot, to a great um, policy consortium. You don't know until you walk those shoes. And I walked those shoes before. So I know what it's like to go to bed hungry and not have. I know what it's like not to have transportation. I know what it's like to want what other people have and, and, and don't have it and can't get it. When I was young, my father was diagnosed with cancer. And at the time he was diagnosed with cancer, we had no idea that he was suffering from cancer. Now the nine kids, he asked for me to come to the hospital to see him. So when I got to the hospital to see him and, and went there, they were trying to operate on him. Like either they were trying to stop the blood or bleeding or whatever. But he asked me to go to school and come back and help the poor people. And then at the age of 17, I didn't understand, I didn't understand what, would, what do you mean come back and help the poor people? How can I help the poor people and we are poor ourselves? So what can I give them that we don't have? Of course, we got a telephone call late that night uh, telling us that my dad had died. And that was really uh, the, the, the breaking point for me. And I just promised God, I said, you know, if you just let me survive, if you just let me make it, and uh, I would go to school, I would do whatever it is to be a productive person in the community and come back and help the poor people. I do whatever I can help the poor people. From there, I just been rolling, you know, trying to make a difference in the community because I made a promise to God. And he, uh, he blessed me, he blessed me to get off that plantation. On the morning he died and we, uh, and we were trying to bury him and get ready for his funeral. I recall the plantation owner coming to the house to check on my mom or whatever. But he came in, I opened the door and let him in. And he asked my mother, how was she doing? And she basically said, you know, under the circumstances, you know, it could be better. And then he told her that he would need the house. Now he asked her first about 
two of my brothers being able to work on the plantation that we lived on. And she said, no, she said they must finish high school and uh, go to school and finish high school. So then he walked towards the door and he turned around and he told my mom that uh, they needed a house for another plantation worker and that we had to move. <laughs> it was cold. It was very cold. It was in, in November 1977. And putting us out and telling my mother that she had to move on the day we were trying to funeralize my father, it was devastating. And now, you know, I just want to just give back, give back to other people and not let them go through what I saw my dad go through. My biggest concern with the work that I do and the people that who I'm working with, which are the underserved population, when you walk in those homes and you, 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 you're trying to get people health care or you're trying to get them to become involved in the health care system by getting, getting a physical examination. And it saddens me when I go there, here I am going for to talk about health care, but on the other end, when you see a person don't have food, they don't have gas, they don't have light, that's heartbreaking. So now I got to step out of the shoes that I'm in, addressing health care disparity or cancer health disparity, and try to figure out how can I go back and tap into some of the resources here in my community and ask for donations or ask for a local grocery store in Greenwood called Greenwood Marketplace that who are very good about giving donation. Could you please provide this family with food? On holiday, when you and I are probably sitting there eating turkey and ham, I've gone to people's houses and saw one lady where she was killing blackbirds. Blackbirds, blackbirds, that was her Thanksgiving dinner. That was heartbreaking for me. And to lay there at night, and I do, I lay there many nights, waking up at three and four o'clock in the morning, praying and asking God for additional resources. The resources here in the Mississippi Delta are so few to none. And the people um, that who have the power to help make things better for people, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not in their heart. It's not in their heart. And just trying, to, just trying to provide people with the basis. And again, I go back to say to you, it's, people don't, you know, people, nobody want to be poor. I got with the people and I said, let's create a Fannie Lou Hamer Cancer Foundation. I had gone to Washington, D.C. and participated in a conference that was uh, done by the National Cancer Institute. And I heard uh, this man say, his by the name, his name was uh, Frank Jackson. He was the cancer health disparity uh, director. And I heard him say that Fannie Lou Hamer was his hero and that uh, she had died from breast cancer, stage four breast cancer. I got with two of her adopted daughter and said, look, what about creating a cancer foundation in the name of Ms. Hamer? And the community was very excited about that. We had a meeting, people came to the meeting, we had invited 50 people to the meeting. We had about 75 people from all over. And we just saw the enthusiasm and the excitement and the energy that was from that meeting. Because that meeting was so exciting and the people were so excited about, about the Cancer Coalition, I said, okay, let's go live forward and do a cancer foundation. You know, in less than two months, you got a 501c3 tax ID number. So that was my saying there to go ahead on and do what I had promised God by coming back, uh, helping the poor people in the community. From there, we started the, the Fannie Lou Hamer Cancer Foundation in 2005 or March with a tax ID number. And from there to now, we're still out there helping people. I started this foundation because I've seen so many programs coming into the Mississippi Delta over the years. From my childhood to where I am right now, I see programs always coming in, want to do research, want to do research, want to come in and gather information. And then by the time that people realize that programs in the community is gone because the money for that program I have run out. Now, I'm so grateful to the University of Southern Mississippi, 
where I work. They've been here in this community for 20 plus years. And they have helped with this Fannie Lou Hamer Council Foundation to give people hope, to show them, to give them something that's tangible, you know, and say, this is owned and operated by the people. This is, belongs to you. People help with this foundation. The, the, the community health worker who are known as volunteers, they raise money all the time for the Fannie Lou Hamer Council Foundation. Whenever we are trying to implement a program, uh, uh, health fair, uh, any kind of activities that's addressing cancer, health disparities, it hurts. It hurts a whole lot when you're out there and, you, and you're hearing people asking for help. On any given day, you know, people calling me three, four, five times after five o'clock asking questions. If I go to the grocery store or to Walmart or if I'm in church, I can't leave church, you know, when church is over because people got you in the parking lot and you spend another 30, 40 minutes, sometimes an hour in the parking lot trying to answer questions and trying to give people resources that they need in order to survive. So it's by no means that people don't want help. People do want help. Nobody has to be poor. When we didn't expand the affordable care act for the state of Mississippi, it hurt it. Our patients, it hurt the community as a whole, and it hurt our uh, medical providers. And it's a shame that people don't see the need to expand uh, the Affordable Care Act, something that should have been expanded, something that needed to be expanded. And because of the lack of not having the Affordable Care Act, people just don't have the money to go to the doctor. Even with people who got insurance, your, uh, your deductibles are so high. My deductible for my insurance is, is $1,000. And I have to spend $1,000, you know, towards medical even before I can start seeing anything. And when people don't have any health insurance and trying to go to the doctor, and when you try to out there in the community telling a person to be screened for prostate screening or for getting a mammogram I just go get your physical examination done and for what they say I don't have any insurance so if I got cancer how would I pay for it if if, if I if I'm a diabetic how can I get my medicine those are the type of questions that you're hearing people say we do need Medicare uh, Medicaid and we do need the expansion uh, the expansion of the Affordable Care Act that's something that's very needed and I'm seeing our rural, our rural uh, healthcare medical providers. Some doors are closed. We are losing some hospitals because there is not enough uh, patients coming through those doors, keeping those doors open. And people can't come if you don't have insurance, or you don't have Medicaid or Medicare. So those physicians got to be paid as well. They can't see everybody free. You have to be innovative and find resources. So one of the resources that I found here in, in the Delta was to create a license plate in the name of Ms. Hamer. And this is the license plate. This license plate was created and uh, done by the people, for the people here in the Mississippi Delta. More than uh, 2,000 people have purchased this license plate. And it's a license plate that approved by the state of Mississippi and every license plate that is purchased by any individual, the state gives the Fannie Lou Hamer Council Foundation a $24 back to the organization. As from 2016 to where we are right now, we have received more than a hundred plus thousand dollars. And that money goes back to the community and it helps people. And knowing that we are able to help people when they call us and say, I need medicine, I need transportation. We are able to get it up, give those people a stipend anywhere from $50 to $250 a stipend for transportation to get back and forth to the, to the doctor. We bought five acres of land in Ruby, Mississippi for a resource that is much needed. And that's a cancer center. Our goal is to put on a 10,000 square foot building, council center, a resource center in Ruby, Mississippi. And I have a copy of this, this, this 
feeling. This is the uh, foundation that we're trying to raise $2.5 million to put in Rubia, Mississippi. We have raised more than $800,000 towards this project. And we've been working on this project since 2005 and it's 2020. It's a long process. It's very tedious. Um, there's some nights you cry. There's some days you're happy because people like you that come into the Mississippi Delta and you've seen the need. Pecora have come to the Mississippi Delta and have seen the need and they have supported the work that we do at the University of Southern Mississippi and with the Fannie Lou Hamer Cancer Foundation. And because of that, of that national uh, recognition from uh, your organization, from Patient Advocacy Foundation and from Pecora, it has helped open up doors. Welcome to another episode of Advocates in Action, a podcast created by the National Patient Advocate Foundation, a nonprofit that develops initiatives promoting equitable access to affordable quality health care through policy action and partnerships. I'm your host, Ashley Freeman. This rheumatologist started me on one medication and said, it will take a while to work. Okay, I knew that. It does take, these medicines do take a while to work and it was not responding and he and the rheumatologist kept saying well just give it a little bit longer just give it a little bit longer you don't need anything else when i got to the point of to where i was wearing all i could wear were dresses that my husband would help me put on in the morning and the only shoes i could wear were little sandals to you know like flip-flops to put on when i told the rheumatologist this his response was well you sure look nice in that. And it, it looks like it's comfortable. For me, that was the last straw. I knew I had done my research and I had seen it happen with my mother and my grandmothers. And I knew what the importance of good and aggressive medicine. And that was not happening for me. I was, I was seeing permanent damage was occurring. My hands were changing shape. And I knew that 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 just wasn't acceptable. Then I started looking around, where else can I go? Uh, the two closest hubs uh, were an hour and a half, two and a half hours away, um, but it would have been a minimum of six months to even get in to see a rheumatologist. Um, and that was if I got put on the waiting list. And, you know, that's not from anything, any fault of my own. It was, just, that was just the numbers, the way it was. So I started talking to friends and family members and they started advocating for me, got connected with an incredible rheumatologist uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, four hours from where I live. Went there and it was completely different, completely different attitude, uh, completely different prognosis and outcome and um, just the way I was treated with respect, like, you know, that, that maybe I could have input into my treatment and have input into what I was hoping for, not just having to settle for what was possibly acceptable to the, the previous rheumatologist. Wow, what a difference that made. But you said it's four hours one way, which is eight hours round trip, which is a typical work day. Tell me a little bit about that journey to get the care that you deserve. I can't do that trip by myself. Um, so my husband has to take me. And since we're both professors, uh, we have to schedule this when we have like school breaks or schedule it in the summer. Um, and like you said, it is a full day. A lot of times we may stay with uh, friends or family members in the area and then come back the next day. Ideally, my rheumatologist would like to see me every three months because of the medicine that I'm on. Um, but that's just not, that's just not feasible. He has worked it out to where the university clinic here, uh, he sends my lab work to them. They draw the blood, send it off, and then send the results to him. 
We do some telehealth. We were doing telehealth before the pandemic came around because not only taking away my work day for the both of us, but also the, the stress and the, the energy required for those trips can uh, bring on a flare or just not be very helpful as a whole. Good afternoon. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the team at MPAF for inviting me to speak today. Um, my name is Kathleen Gallagher. I am the VP of Health Services Research at Patient Advocate Foundation. And as Alan mentioned, I'm going to be doing a data spotlight on our rural patients served by our case management team in 2019. And I'm also gonna share with you some of our recent survey highlights, specifically looking at our rural population. So just as a little bit of an introduction, approximately 7 million people or 29% of the United States population live in rural or remote areas. We know that there's significant differences in healthcare access between rural and urban areas. Many of the patients in rural communities are at a disadvantage when seeking healthcare services, specifically specialty services, distance to travel, reliable internet and cell coverage are often barriers to their care. Also, reluctance to seek health care in rural areas can also be based on cultural and financial constraints. So Patient Advocate Foundation provides diverse case management services to patients with over 600 different chronic illnesses. We provide telephone-based financial and social needs navigation services, and these are often one of the most reliable methods to assist patients in rural populations to address barriers to care. In 2019, the case management team served just over 2,500 rural patients, and this was approximately 17% of the total population served. So geographically, where are our rural patients located? So as you can see from the density map, the vast majority of the rural patients that we served in 2019 are along the southern and eastern part of the United States. But like their rural counterparts, most of our urban and suburban case management patients are also located in these areas, specifically the south, which is about 50% of the individuals that we assessed. Um, our partners, our programs, and our research activities contribute to the makeup of our case management population, and this does explain the higher concentration of patients served along the eastern seaboard. However, our education, advocacy, and health equity teams are working towards increasing engagement with rural patients, providers, and community groups to help them improve their knowledge about PAF as well as our resources. So what do our rural case management patients look like? Approximately 39% of patients served are male, 61 female. We served approximately 6% Hispanic, 16% African-American, but the predominant rural patient that we serve is Caucasian. 15% of them were uninsured in 2019. The vast majority are over the age of 56 with 31% being retired and 31% reporting that they were disabled. And not surprisingly, 85% of the individuals we assisted in rural communities had a household income less than 48,000 per year. However, most of the demographic character characteristics that we see in our rural population were actually similar to our urban and suburban patients. Although the slight differences are that our rural patients are more likely to be male, Caucasian, older than their, rural, than their urban or suburban counterparts. So what were the issues that our patients in their rural communities came to us with? Well, the top five were transportation, pharmaceutical copay, doctor visit copay, rental assistance, and utility assistance. The top five issues that are reported by all case management patients are actually the same regardless of location. However, the order in which this assistance was, requ was requested for the five 
different items varied across the three groups. As you saw on the previous slide, rural communities transportation was their number one need, whereas utility assistance was the number one need for urban patients. One of the other things that our case management team does is to work on behalf of the patient to obtain debt relief for them. So in, in 2019, you can see that across all of our patients, we acquired almost $12 million. If you look at that by our rural, suburban, and urban patients, you can see the dollar amounts, as well as you can see the percent of the total debt relief that went to patients in those areas. Not surprisingly, the rural community saw a much lower percentage of the debt relief, but when you actually look and compare it to the percentage of our case management caseload, it's actually not as unequitable as one would assume. To better put this in perspective, we actually decided to look at the average debt relief obtained per patient. So the blue bars look at the total debt relief divided by the number of patients for all of the debt relief acquired. As you can see, our rural patients, the debt relief per patient is lower than what you would see in our urban populations. To get a better grasp, we actually excluded all of the patient, the individual patients who had no, had debt relief obtained for them over 50,000. And as you can see in the yellow bars, this actually brings the Delta much closer on a per patient debt relief obtained. And this is because in our rural communities, we only had six individuals with debt relief over 50,000. We had 16 and 19 in the urban and suburban. Now I'm gonna switch gears just a little bit to actually give you uh, some insight into a couple of surveys that we conducted in 2019 and 2020. The first survey statistic I'm gonna share with you was from our retrospective survey. This particular survey was done in the, it was done in January of 2019. And we actually asked our patients questions in multiple distinct domains. Um, one of the ones I wanted to share with you was a promise measure, which is about physical health. So we asked patients how they felt that their, that their physical health was in the last week. And as you can see, our rural patients had a much lower response for excellent or very good, as opposed to their suburban and urban counterparts. In fact, they were almost two to three times, to be two to three times less likely to report high levels of health. Another measure that we wanted to capture was just asking patients about general distress. So this is just general distress, not financial distress. So patients answered on a zero to 10 scale. And as you can see in gray, rural patients were more likely to experience higher level levels of distress in the seven days prior to taking our survey than their suburban and urban counterparts. The second survey that we did in October of 2019 was around the impact of their chronic disease diagnosis on their ability to work. So looking at the time of di at their time of diagnosis, we can see that our rural patients were more likely to be retired or disabled at the time of their diagnosis and to be diagnosed at an older age than their urban counterparts. So it's important to think about this because the next question, series of questions we asked them was about the amount of time that they needed to take off during treatment. So when we asked for those who were employed, did you take time off? You can see that our rural population answered almost twice as much as our, as our other populations in terms of needing to take time off. When we asked how much time they took off, you can see that although for most of the uh, for four to six month, two to three month, one month, one to three week, and one to seven days, the answers were very similar. You can see that when it was more than six months, our rural communities, our rural patients were needing to take more time. 
The next question we asked in this work impact survey was around physician conversations. Specifically, did your doctor have a conversation with you about the impact of treatment on your ability to work? And as you can see, this conversation happened with more frequency with our rural patients than with our suburban and urban. The last survey that I'm going to talk about was the COVID-19 pandemic impact survey. And this is one that we launched in June and May of this past year. And specifically, I'm going to share with you some of, this, some of the statistics we have around access to care and telehealth. So we asked our patients, have you changed the way that you access care or have you changed how or where you receive it? And as you can see in the red box, our rural patients were more likely to delay care, and they were also more likely to indicate that they were using telehealth options. When asked how many telehealth visits they've had since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, interestingly enough, our urban patients were more likely to report a higher number of telehealth visits. And this actually may be, may be in response to when we asked patients about concerns using telehealth or barriers to using telehealth, we can see that our rural patients were almost twice as likely to have issues with internet, data, and cellular services than their, than their urban counterparts. And this could have impacted their ability to actually have conduct or receive a telehealth visit. So there are a few limitations to the data that I've shared with you today. So currently, right, right now, our location data are self-reported, and it's actually only captured in our case management and survey questionnaires. However, we're currently exploring the use of geolocation data, which are referred to as RUCA and ADI codes, to allow us to utilize addresses and nine-digit zip code information across all of our PAF service silos. For the survey components, those are, administered during, those are administered via email, which means that they would require web access or cellular data to complete. Lastly, confounding factors in our survey data were not controlled in, in the presented stratifications. So other factors such as demographics or a diagnosis may also be influencing the differences seen between the two location groups. We're currently working with multiple academic partners to conduct formal statistical analyses of our survey data, including the use of RUCA and ADI codes to address location and other research questions. So in summary, case management patients served by PAF are a fairly homogenous group regardless of location. Although the top issue for rural patients was transportation, their top five issues are identical to those sought by their urban and rural counterparts. Rural patients reported poorer physical health and higher levels of general distress than their rural and urban counterparts, and rural patients were more likely to be disabled or retired when diagnosed and to take more time off for treatment. Higher levels of rural employed patients indicated that their physician discussed treatment impact on their workability. And this is also probably related to the potential for them to need to travel farther distances for care. And rural patients were more likely to delay care and use telehealth options. However, they also reported twice as many issues with internet data and cellular services. I'd like to close out this, this presentation with sharing from our cost of care focus group a quote from one of our participants. We are an economically oppressed, underserved area. There's not a whole lot of draw here or incentives for providers to come here unless you're from here. It's beautiful, but it's very remote, very rugged. They have had a hard time getting providers here, so there hasn't been that continuity of care that the people here really deserve. I'd like to thank everybody for their time today. As Gwen mentioned earlier, please enter questions about today's presentation into the chat function in Zoom, and Jamie will be monitoring and moderating the chat to read viewer questions. 
I'd also like to acknowledge my colleagues, Rebecca Angove and Eric Anderson for their support with this project and this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. All right, I'm going to go through some of the questions. There's been heavy dialogue during your presentation. Really good comments. Um, one question that was sent privately to me, do you have data on the impact of hospitals closing in rural areas? So uh, Jamie, it's, 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 it's an interesting question. As of right now, we don't, but it but because we are increasing our capacity to be able to use geolocation data, um, that is something that we could potentially look at. So we could, we could look in a particular area at uh, patients that we've served and look to see uh, have different um, hospitals closed in that area, or we could actually look to see what, would, what do they report as their distance traveled to care. And then we'd be able to map that. Great, thank you. Another um, question from Tracy in the chat box came, um, why do you think doctors talk with rural patients more about taking time off from work? Ma, based off of everything that I've heard today um, and my own gut instinct, I would guess it's because probably that patient will need to travel farther for care or will need to get care that's not in their immediate community. Okay, and another question from Dicey Scroggins. Hello, Mary. In terms of telehealth, could you say a little about the satisfaction level with or patient feelings relative to in-person versus telehealth services? Yeah, so we, we did ask a couple of questions around satisfaction with um, telehealth services in our initial COVID um, survey. And if I remember correctly, um, I did not stratify it by, by location, but across all of our participants, um, it was between 70 and 80% were satisfied with the telehealth services that they'd received. Hey, and the next question from Kate O'Reilly. Can you tell me which distress scale you use to measure the distress levels? Yes, it was the NCCN general distress thermometer. Great, and from Greg, have you used the national core indicators data as it applies to individuals with disabilities and older adults? Uh, we have not, we have not reviewed, looked at, or used that tool. Okay. Um, another follow-up question, is distress exhibited in the same way across populations? If not, how do we compare those levels? Um, we, I mean, we've looked at, um, the, the distress results across several different, um, sub populations. Um, and, and generally it, it just kind of de depends on what we're trying to compare. Um, we did use the, uh, distress thermometer for a pre and post, um, case management intervention, um, study. And we did see that general distress did decrease after patients, um, had interacted with our case managers, as well as we saw that general distress also decreased after um, patients were linked to other financial resources that Patient Advocate Foundation provides. Great, and I think there's one more. Uh, is there a way? To, is there a way for Wi-Fi devices? Okay, I'm sorry. Is there a way to, I, I guess, get Wi-Fi to, to underserved people or families? I know with education they do and provide buses with hotspots here in North Carolina. Um, to, to date, I don't know of any specific um, projects that, that we've been involved in. I've definitely heard antidotally um, from different 
um, health professionals in different communities of how they've been trying to help patients who are in need of having access to, to a hotspot to be able to do a telehealth visit. So for example, I recently attended the APHA conference and they mentioned that there were several coffee shops, restaurants, um, bookstores, they actually boosted their their free Wi-Fi signals so patients could actually sit in their parking lots in the privacy of their cars to be able to do a telehealth visit either with a, a laptop, a tablet, or their phone and to, to have access to, to Wi-Fi. Great, and another follow-up from Lisa. Did you use NCCND checklists for specific forms of distress? So when we used the general distress uh, thermometer in the pre and the post, we did include the checklist. Um, with that, there were a few items that we did not include because they would not be applicable to the population that we serve, but we have not actually um, taken the, the, the thermometer results for that separate survey um, and looked at it or stratified it by the checklist. Great. And from Aurora, is this research available online for sharing? Um, there's definitely elements of some of these surveys that have been, pub been made publicly available. Um, as of right now, because we are working closely with a couple of academic partners on doing some in-depth analyses, um, we're waiting until those activities are completed and we um, do our due diligence of publishing and peer-reviewed journals with them, so. Great, and another one from Mary. Did you find that the lack of engagement in telehealth, telemed telemedicine might relate to bandwidth or lack of knowledge about its availability? Do patients commonly know about telehealth and how to use or engage with it? So in our COVID survey, we did ask some, uh, some additional questions around um, patients' uh, comfortable comfortability with using telehealth, so whether or not they felt like that, that they had the skill set. Um, we did not ask a specific question around whether or not they, they knew about telehealth. Um, but a good percentage of the patients that, that participated at least in our survey um, indicated that they'd had at least one telehealth visit during COVID. Um, so my assumption would be that, that many were familiar with that um, platform, but that, that's, that's an excellent question and an, an excellent uh, point and something that we should look at including in any future surveys. All right, I'm just monitoring to see if we get any additional questions. Oh, Jamie, the last thing I just, I also wanted to highlight one, one of the other data elements that we captured with our telehealth was also recognizing that while telehealth can be the, the video experience that we're having right now, it can also be a telephonic experience. So we, we did ask patients whether or not they had um, phone only or the, the, the video interaction for those telehealth experiences. Great, um, an interesting question from Jenna. Um, her parents were actually denied telehealth options and had to request it a few times from their physician during COVID-19. Do we think that physicians are also a barrier as well? I, I, I think the fact that she experienced it as, as a barrier would be an indicator that not, not everybody is comfortable being on video. Many physicians may not feel comfortable providing advice where they're not actually in the same room as a patient. So um, yeah, it, 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 it probably can be a barrier in some areas, yeah. A question from Greg, are any, 
Are any of your rural clinics, hospitals connected via telehealth with larger healthcare providers? If so, what does that look like? Um, I, I am not sure. Uh, the, our patients who, who receive health in rural areas, I don't, I personally do not know who their specific providers are and what their providers' relationships may be with other academic institutions. Um, I do know that we are partnering with the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill to do a intervention study with them. And specifically, PAF will be offering um, financial and social needs navigation to their rural patients to make sure that they are linked to those, those specific services, though not medical, still in a support function in terms of making sure that that holistic telehealth can be achieved. All of the questions that we have. So with that, thank you, Kate, so much for your presentation. And we were gonna listen to another excerpt from the podcast as we transition to our next documentary about eating healthy in North Country. Just one person to make a difference in one life for that to just kind of be the domino effect. And it really is about kindness. Continue to share love and be there for others. So when I first identified why I wanted to be a patient advocate was because I was lost in the system. It got to a point where I was dealing with my own health issues. My son was sick now. I was working full time, my husband was working full time, and then we get hit with all these medical bills, we get hit with all these diagnoses we didn't understand, and I work in the healthcare field. And I'm sitting here going, oh my gosh, is this really happening? Like, I, if I can't understand this, how are our patients understanding this? It's not fair. It started with helping people understand their insurance. A few friends calling me saying, you know, I got this bill and I don't understand why. I'd say, okay, come over. And we would sit there and we'd go through it together. It got to a point where people just get so confused and it, it is confusing. Our system is so messed up. It was done that way. So people could get so confused and they just go, oh, well, I'm confused. So I'm just gonna let it be. And then it grew to, someone would call me and say, I can't afford my prescription this month. Do you know who I can call or where? where can I go? So then <laughs> I would start making phone calls for them or I would, you know, find out what, what can I do to help. Every day I would find a different way I could do things. So if I could help cover their meals for the day, that would in turn help them buy that medicine they needed. And then now it's kind of grown into, I have a community of people on Facebook. I think the last time I looked at, it, it's grown to like over 600 people. Oh so now God. it's like, it's, it's expanded past my own community. <laughs> and that's okay, I, you know, I'm happy with that. I think there's something really magical about that. And that's why I really admire our patient advocates who do this day in and day out and really understand that even as one individual, your impact is so much larger than you can even imagine. Absolutely. The community is really tight knit. Um, we're a rural, rural community, so everything is spread out really far. Um, lots of driving, um, some, some lack of resources as far as uh, uh, public transportation and things like that. Um, a lot of folks here earn a living um, uh, doing manual jobs. We have a lot of, uh, like we have wire mills and, and things like that around the area that employ a large part of the North Country um, so, you know, I've come to, to love the North Country for a lot of what it offers, not just the uh, outside activities, but just also the close-knit and the, the, the more stronger community vibe, I would guess, I, I would say, you know, it presents. There's definitely some, some barriers as far as, you know, attending multiple healthcare visits. Um, it's, it's one thing if you see your doctor once a year, but for people with chronic conditions, trying to get to their doctor once every three months for follow-ups, um, you know, seeing um, concurrent providers that are maybe specialists and trying to uh, 
you know, maybe from Littleton going down to a, a big hospital, say like Dartmouth Hitchcock, which is, you know, about an hour and a half away. Um, that's, you know, that's not feasible for a lot of community members um, who, you know, trying to make ends meet. I think some of the food insecurity is geographic location. And just because you have access to a store that sells food, it may or may not be affordable. So if, if you're the only shop in town, you can set your prices differently and they may or may not be helpful to the people that you're selling your products to. In addition to that, as Chad mentioned, we have an economy here that is partly predicated on some small manufacturing. And within that, there is some better job security. At the same time, we have seasonal employment sometimes related to the tourism industry. So I think that the underlying uh, financial insecurity is part of the food insecurity. A lot of people, um, working class families are really struggling um, to not only purchase healthy foods, but are struggling to, you know, come to terms with how, if they had healthy food, how are they going to prepare it so everyone's going to eat it? Um, you know, you really, you know, you really can't go from, you know, receiving nutrition education to eating healthy. I think there's a, there's a step missing there. So um, what I've kind of grown in my position here to do is kind of take a step back and address that intermediate step. And, you know, saying not only do we need to eat healthy, but we need to kind of talk about the tools that people can use to eat healthy, offer them the resources, um, it's hard again, I think, to um, you know, to be in a position as a healthcare provider to say to someone you need to eat um, you know more vegetables when you know they might not have all of the resources to not only get those, but they have no idea once they get a head of broccoli in the kitchen how to prepare it. Um, you know what you know what different ways you can cook it. Um, you know that kind of thing. So I think. You know, I've I've grown to love that intermediate step of trying to um, talk about cooking and cooking and nutrition fundamentals. It's really clear for me that food and nutrition is a significant social determinant of health. And with Chad, we have the resources uh, beyond one on one to help one on many people. And if we can get people to see the value, things that they've never tried before. He managed to get uh, this book. Uh, what do we have? 5,000 of them, I think we got. Chad got through a grant. And it dispels the myth that eating healthy has to be expensive. And he's had people try things like parsnips that they probably couldn't identify, let alone try. So it's he's, he's really gotten people to be a little more adventurous. And I think it's also important that we have a food pantry under our auspices. There's also access to commodity surplus food and, a, and some grocery stores. So we're not completely a food desert. Yet in a rural area, 26 towns, our uh, Warren facility is 22 miles to get to a grocery store. You know, so I, I think he's found ways to have people think about how do you take your commodity surplus food, your food pantry food, and what you can afford to buy. And these are the sorts of things that you can do. So it makes my life easy working with someone like Chad. You know, up here we have we have access to produce. We have a, uh, a community-owned food cooperative right across the street with lots of local produce and things like that. We have supermarkets. Um, but I can tell you, in, in in the years I've been here, just about I think within the last two years, I've I've visited multiple of our elementary schools that uh, are in our service area, and I was taken back by some of the observations I made with with the kids there and uh, some of the comments they made. Um, I, I did um, a, a presentation type of event at one of our local elementary schools and brought a bunch of prepared produce, both fruits and vegetables, so we'd get a good mix. And basically my, my goal was to expose them to fruits and vegetables, but not only that, but provide some different dips that the kids could you know, kind of evaluate and say, oh, I like, you know, broccoli with this dip and I like apples with this dip and they can take home some recipes to their parents and, you know, work with that type of thing. Um, I was 
I was taken back by some of the comments when, you know, some of the girls and boys had said, oh, what is this? And they hold up a strawberry and, you know, they had never eaten a strawberry before or they had never, um, you know, when we looked at bell peppers, they had they'd only eaten green bell peppers. They didn't know red bell peppers existed. Uh, kiwi fruit, cauliflower, these things were, you know, uh, there was so much like, oh, what is this? You know, I was like, oh, um, it's an eye-opening experience because, you know, I, I live a life where, you know, it's